Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chris Lubkeman. I'm head of foresight at the ETH Zurich and your host for today's global lecture and dialogue entitled Creating a Culture of Innovation. The ETH Global Lecture Series is a platform we've created for contemporary topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. Each month, we bring two individuals together to discuss their personal interests and insights, experiences, and expertise. In addition to simply satisfying our curiosity to learn, we also hope that these dialogues will expand our perspectives so we can broaden our thinking challenge our opinions, and through this, enable us all to make even more meaningful contributions to society. I am truly excited about today's dialogue and honored to host this conversation with two amazing humans. The first, I'd like to introduce Arva Titsani. She was one of the first employees at Elon Musk's Boring Company where she was lead civil engineer for several years, then the co-director of the Hyperloop competitions and the director of the Not A Boring competition. Arva is now the infrastructure project manager at Relativity Space, a company whose mission it is to design, build, and launch 3D printed rockets. So welcome Arva. Thank you so Hi. much, Chris. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. And I believe you're out on the West Coast in California. Is that correct? I am. Sunny Southern California. Woohoo. Well, it's great <laughs> to have you here. And your discussion partner today is Adrian Glauser. He is the head of the Laboratory for Astronomical Instrumentation at ETH Zurich, where he develops hardware and software of thermal infrared instruments for the world's largest ground and space-based telescopes. He's an experienced instrumental astrophysicist. Those are really hard words to say altogether, I have to tell you. And has spent the past 18 years working on the James Webb Space Telescope Project, or the JWT, I believe, or JWST, you can correct me. And I hope he's gonna give us an insight about the project today. So welcome, Adrian. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you, Chris. It's wonderful. And you are sitting in the library, our wonderful your background library in Zurich, correct? Actually, in my office, but also at ETH, indeed. <laughs> Fantastic. And is it the JWST or the JWT? It's the James Webb Space Telescope, but they rebranded it now to the Webb Space Telescope. So we can shorten it, the Webb. Ah, OK. <laughs> the Webb, OK. So. Our time together today will be about 60 minutes. I will start our dialogue and then you, our audience who are also here with us today, will have the opportunity to ask questions by entering them into the Q&A button and I will do my very, very best to integrate all of them into our dialogue today. I can't promise that we will, but I'm pretty good at doing that. So we're gonna get into a conversation. So without any further ado, are we ready? Indeed. Absolutely. Okay, so out of a culture of innovation, what does this mean to you when you think these two big words together, culture and innovation, what does it mean to you? Well, it means that you are creating the right environment, you're valuing the right things, you're developing the correct relationships that encourage people to think outside the box and to create something that truly impacts the world around them in whatever field they choose. And so when, when you say you create an environment that allows one to make the right decisions, yeah. So what, what does that look like? Is it like, the, like, is well, it like our background with a whole bunch of books everywhere? <laughs> or? It means that for example, when you're speaking in the environment of a team, right, you're, let's say, building a project together, you have to be able to empower those people to create something different, to think outside the box and to affect something. For example, you can assign people specific tasks, 
you can assign them small tasks that ultimately, when everyone's tasks are combined, will complete the project. Or you can give people the ultimate goal of the project, what you wish to reach, and allow them to also be able to think on a high level of how to make this project better. How can you improve it? And in addition to their tasks, they can then think outside the box and they can innovate. So it's, it's that almost empowerment and inspiration to be better as a whole rather than just do an individual mm -hmm. small task. That's at so, least in my experience. That's great. No, that's really great. So, but and Adrian, you, oh, um, what do you think about that? Yeah. With the culture, I immediately think about you have to have a team, otherwise you don't need a culture. I mean, innovation can happen on an individual level as well, but the, the innovation I was involved with always happened with a rather large team. And so for me, it is then about how to enable the team to perform, not only to actually fulfill the task, but to actually really bring, bring it to its best performance. And that only works if the um, individuals of that team manage to work together in a way that each individual's strength um, is enhanced and the weaknesses are compensated by, by complementary team members. And so this is usually not happening from one day to the next. This is a, usually a very long process and not always easy. But um, in terms of the cultural aspect, I think it is then about how uh, in a leadership role, how can you actually bring this forward? How can you bring the team forward so that um, yeah, the performance can actually be delivered. So thank you for that. Both of you work in very high performance environments. I mean, outer space is probably the most unforgiving environment, one of the most unforgiving, and, and both of you are working in that. So when you think of that, how, how give me an example of where you could say, hey, that was a really beautiful example of the culture of innovation, which I believe in, like for in both of your projects, because you give me an like a real example, and how it came to how it came to pass. Can either of you think of one? Absolutely, I can think of a few. Um, okay, if I can start from years ago, uh, back towards you know the hyperloop and boring company uh, time, I can think of a specific moment where my entire team was given a current problem that we had. We were ongoing in a project, an active project. We were all excited. We knew the ultimate goal of the project and we were all inspired by that goal. And we were presented with an issue. Now that issue could have been handled by a specific team of people that were more technically able in handling that issue, right? So let's say it's a, geology issue. They could have just given it to the geologists, the geotechnical engineers uh, to solve that problem. But instead they presented it to the whole team and said, hey, here's an issue. And if we solve this issue, we're able to save a lot of money, a lot of time and achieve our goal much, much better. So mm -hmm. we were able then to be empowered to solve that problem, right. not just from one perspective, but from several different perspectives, thinking outside of the box of geology, and we were able to solve that problem. Granted, but, we were told crazy ideas were welcome, and we indeed gave crazy ideas, and a crazy idea solved the issue. But, but let me just let me, devil's advocate for a moment. Isn't that terribly inefficient? With all these people sitting there who have nothing to know about anything, I mean. Well, like I said, it was an issue that had great ramifications for the project. And it was also presented to those who were technically able to solve it. But if we're able to solve it in a much better fashion and you have a team who is dedicated to this project, who is inspired to achieve this project, I don't think that's inefficient at all. I think it's creative. And I think you're able to achieve much more when you open that mindset. Great. That's a great example. Adrian, how about you? Give it one. Well, I, I would have a negative example, if that's also permitted. Um, where, great, of course. Uh, we learn uh, from negative, too. Absolutely. 
the the the, the cultural aspect also has to uh, another element and uh, being in europe and uh, me sitting in a small country usually requires uh, collaborating with many uh, international partners which have all very different cultural backgrounds so that is the, the other aspect of the culture and so we were in a, in a project that um, uh, we had a consortium of institutes uh, i think 16 different institutes uh, different languages and of course yeah different working approaches to solve problems and uh, we faced a moment where basically trust and that is one of the topics i certainly or we should certainly talk about trust was was um somehow um disintegrated so there was an issue and then it was a blaming exercise one blames the other and you know how things can go wrong mm -hmm. and luckily this was resolved but it was clearly a, a situation where the culture was um going back to your isolated view and, and forget about the team that you know your colleague might be very different approaching a certain problem than you but still you have to work together and usually this works quite well uh, but it can go wrong and then yeah basically innovation so, prevented it's a, that's a really great point so i guess you have trust and then respect yeah right so to what degree here's an interesting for me an interesting question for both of you does respect and quote expertise play right i think here i i really have um an experience made with a, with a, an ongoing project that is also in a similar setup a lot of partners are involved where we went through this famous storming phase you know you had uh, you came together everyone is very excited that's quite easy in our business because the projects we do are exciting for those people who are actually working in this area uh, so everyone works on the biggest telescopes uh, clearly very fond of it and yet you have a new team you might think you know each other but you have these conflicts that come up at some point that because you don't know each other, uh, you don't know the capabilities of the other that you actually can just blind trust the other person. So you start shadow engineering uh, problems, etc., which creates then the friction. And so we, we had a severe time of, of this storming phase until, yeah, we cleaned up the team configuration and trust was built up over, over time. And now we are in a phase, I have to say, which is excellent to work with because we mm we blindly tr trust each other and that yeah as i said before it, it takes time and if you have the luxury to work in long uh, long time projects as we have you can actually grow in the team uh, i think it's more difficult if you have short uh, short projects that where the teams change all the time mm -hmm. interesting what about you Arva? yeah i i would completely agree that respect has something to do with it uh in my current team for example relativity space we're a team of five, six people approximately. It depends on how you define our team. And we have a great amount of respect for each other. And that really encourage us, encourages us to, I guess, propose different solutions, propose ideas, to have an open discussion about things, to talk about things that perhaps are not broken, but can be improved. And you, you truly do, inspire people more when you show them respect. If, if you don't respect someone or if they feel disrespected, they're not really encouraged to speak up. They're not really encouraged to say anything that impacts the project because then they feel that they're unable to provide an impact. Mm. Completely agree. Yeah. Although I don't think expertise rather than rather has as much to do with innovation because you can be completely not knowledgeable about a subject, but have a great idea of something that is of either an issue that needs to be solved or something that can be better or something that can affect everyone in a large group of people. So you don't necessarily have to be an expert, but you have to have the ability to know that you need to create a team of experts in order to solve that problem. Yeah, totally agree. I totally agree. I think I, I keep myself considering as a, a non-expert in all fields, but because I'm a little expert in all fields, I somehow think I can actually talk to everyone. <laughs> and, and that is key, uh, so fully subscribe to you, what you just said. I think what, what happens often with um, more junior people maybe, which are uncertain themselves, they might be shy to bring in their own ideas because they think, oh, whatever I say, um, will be turned down because of the lack of yeah, respect. Um, the, this is also cause a situation where great ideas actually um, got unheard and um, 
yeah. So I think there's there's that there's also, and I'd be very curious how both of you have dealt with this. It's just different personality types in the sense of an extrovert always gets the word, or an introvert, he or she could, or they could be very quiet in the corner or at the table. I just, so how, yeah. within that culture, how do you, what are some of the things that you do? Again, in my case, what hap- uh, what helps is time. That uh, well, now with COVID, it was more difficult. But uh, before, mm-hmm. we had these many, many occasions to meet people outside of the usual business framework. Maybe during a social event or a dinner or a coffee break, where you you know start learning each other and again uh, understanding actually who has which quality. That also the shy people or the quiet people can then uh, be brought into the context of the of the team discussion while maybe the louder people can be suppressed um, uh, because you know actually there might be less substance in, in what they say uh, but this again takes time and if you have the time available then uh, this is very helpful if you don't have it then it's it's difficult yeah. yeah i also think that you have to be able to know where people are comfortable and how they're comfortable expressing their ideas right so for example I'm an extrovert, which I think is obvious. I have a loud voice. I like to talk. I'm excited to speak to new people and I'm not afraid to, to go up to them and talk to them um, and to say my opinion, to say my ideas. However, I had several people on my team who are, in my opinion, geniuses. They're very technically knowledgeable people and they're very skilled at what they do, but they're the opposite of me. They don't like to speak out loud. They don't like to speak up in meetings. They have these ideas, but they don't express them in a big group of people. What I tried to do was try to figure out how they are able to express these ideas. Because I was, for example, the largest group that I ever managed was when I was the chief engineer for uh, my Hyperloop team. Uh, I had 60 engineers under me from different fields, very, very different personalities. Um, And some of them were, again, some of the most skilled people just didn't have a loud voice, but I knew that they were able to um, do the things that we needed them to do. So I tried emailing, I tried having Mm -hmm. one-on-ones, I tried texting, I tried just calling, maybe not being in person. I tried um, writing on a whiteboard where we would just have a session where I would write a question on a whiteboard and they would try to answer it through the whiteboard. So you really just have to figure out how you can bring people ideas and words out and how they're comfortable doing it and you have to realize you can't really change everyone so in the beginning I I would always say can you please speak louder please speak louder I can't hear you please speak louder and I would sit on purpose I would sit on the opposite side of the room so that I would encourage them to speak louder but for some people you know that's who they are you can't change that and you just have to find a way that that works for them you got to stay closer to them. Yeah. That's the other. <laughs> that's, you know. And Adrian, what about any other any other tricks? I think, Arva, that's really great. Thank you for that. And any other tricks you've seen? Oh, I just was, I had a question to Arva, actually, because um, I, I mentioned before the time aspect, but uh, how much time did you have to actually learn this huge team? Uh, I mean, th- this didn't happen from one day to the other, I guess. No, it didn't. So this project happened, well... We built the team over about a few months and we had a total of, I believe, seven months to build everything out. So we had a little bit of time in the beginning. Of course, it took some time to get things going. Um, And then seven months, you know, to build a high speed vehicle from scratch was, was, you know, not enough time, but we had to rush and we had to do it. So on one hand, we had time with each other, a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. And on another hand, it was not enough time to actually build the work that we needed to. So we really had to push ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's very rapid from my, <laughs> from my perspective. Yeah. Um, maybe the only thing I can, can add is also that you have, have to accept that in some cases, um, there are elements in the team that you cannot um, correct for. Um, sure. That sometimes is also the pain you have to take to, to maybe replace um, some, some of the members. Uh, usually that happens not very fast, but um, yeah, this also is, is part of the problem. Or Yeah, as part of being a good manager, a good leader, is knowing when you have to change, make the changes. But both of you mentioned a word I like to come back to, and that's goal. 
that it's really important in your minds when you're looking at this in your teams have this a goal mm-hmm. and is this both a big goal and then smaller goals or do you think you just got to have that goal and you do whatever you got to do and how do you how do you parse out yeah. from a this innovation standpoint arva yeah i think you always at least in my experience, you have something that you're driving to. So something bigger that's perhaps a little bit longer term that you're driving to, that you're pushing people towards. They have to see that star in the sky to know where they're going. On the other hand, you should have smaller milestones that are leading up to that goal in order to organize Mm -hmm. everyone's priorities, to organize their time, to organize their ideas, organize the path that they're taking to that ultimate goal. So you absolutely have to have both in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Adrian, what about you? Well, I'm personally very much driven by very high level goals. Uh, Without them, I couldn't work. And, uh, you know, even if the goal is you work on the biggest satellite or whatever, that is sufficient to be, uh, you know, self-driven over a day of boring work or um, administrative work or whatever you name it. Um, that has nothing to do directly with this high-level goal. But if if you're driven by this, you know, vision or dream or whatever, that that you do something that is much bigger than you you personally, uh, that is bigger than actually the team that is working on, that is really for you know something higher. Uh, I think then everyone is just uh, performing naturally, and uh, I have the privilege to work in this environment, and um, that makes it very easy to motivate people. Because I'll come to you in just a second, Arvind, because I know you said when we were talking a bit earlier that you always knew you wanted to do this. You're, you're, but yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, you know. So what was your, when you were like 16 or 12 or two, I don't know how, when, when did this goal of being a part of the team delivering the world's largest telescope emerge? Uh, okay, that is a big jump. <laughs> what, what what I came up with as a as a boy was um, the inspiration of um, astronomy, the stars, and also on the other side, um, the the rockets, the the manned missions to the moon, and so on. And so for me, I had a dream as a boy. I would say ten years old I was, where I really said astronomy. That's what I would like to do. But it was on the same time also being in the NASA control center in Houston, talking to the astronauts. That is actually. I never wanted to go to space, but um, talking to the people in space, that was the dream I had as a boy. Of course, in the path towards my current um, professional career, um, there, there, there was a long path and it was not always straight. There were deviations. I studied particle physics, not astrophysics, because of lack of um, huh. disposition at the university I was. And so at the end, I... I intentionally looked for for going back to astronomy, going into instrumentation, because I knew after the study, after school, that this is really what I would like to do. And then yeah. James Webb catch me. Uh, so it was not that I I knew the biggest satellite when it was 10. Uh, there was luck and yeah. uh, coincidence, but yeah, it was also, it, it had to be that way. But the, but the luck and the coincidence created a resonance with you, which you then took advantage of. Absolutely. I mean, I remember... The day I, I got this email from my, at that time, uh, uh, PhD supervisor saying, actually, we might have a big fish uh, coming. It's called the Next Generation Space Telescope. At that time, that was the name of, of the web. Um, and I Googled it. And, you know, there were just very rough sketches of something that looked quite different from, the, from James Webb nowadays. And I just knew, you know, this was mind blowing. I said, this, whatever it does, I don't care. This is what I have. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like when you say, yeah. I don't care what it does, but I'm going to be a part of it. Oh, it's just, you know, um, usually we, we try to be science driven, saying you have the science question and, had, and with that you, you build an instrument. But James Webb is just serving all astronomical questions, I would say. And therefore, that's what I meant. Uh, I, don't, I don't care which science it serves in astronomy. It will, yeah. it will be just a huge step. Yeah. That's really, that's really cool. Now, Arvind, what about you? Did you have this goal to be the rocket ship, to be 3D printing a rocket ship when you were 10 <laughs> years old? Uh, I didn't. I think the question is a little bit more, more personal for me. Um, so I'm, I'm an immigrant to the country that I'm currently in, as are my parents. And 
you know, I come from a country that's very, very different from where I'm at right now, where, yep. you know, different situations, um, different circumstances, different outlook on life, um, and a certain lower level of hope almost. And yep. coming from a family of engineers, um, my perspective was also skewed in that way. So I always saw how the world that I saw at the time when I was a child could be better from an engineering perspective. Mm, mm. Um, and I saw how my relationships, especially those with my engineering parents, encouraged me to see that. And so when I came to the United States, uh, you know, of course, like every immigrant family, my, par my parents sacrificed a lot to be here. I knew that I had to use my particular skill set to do something that will actually create an impact. Yeah. And from that perspective, that's all I knew is I have this particular skill set. I'm an engineer. I'm curious. Uh, I'm a loud person. And I think I can make a difference somehow. And I want to make yeah. it. Uh, I want yeah. people to be inspired. I want people to think bigger and I want people to have some sort of hope in what we have in the future. So using that, when I started off, you know, as a kid, my dad forced me to be on a computer and learn CAD at a very, very, very young age when I didn't even know what it was. And he would have small things like draw a circle, you know, draw a little house, draw a triangle. <laughs> and he would teach me these things and he forced me to do that. He wouldn't let me go outside. He wouldn't let me be with my friends unless I did that. So that drove me towards civil engineering from a very, very young age. Yeah. Um, but through that, when I was in college, I had a normal job. You know, I had, we were designing buildings, designing commercial uh, land development projects. And, you know, it was a great job. I loved my team, but I didn't feel like, you know, if I wasn't here, nothing in the different or nothing in the world would really be different. And yep. um, that's why I started looking and I was like, well, what is exciting? What excites me? What can I, what can I do to, to make things better? I feel like I can make something different. And that's yep. what drove me to Hyperloop in the first place. And this goes back to the, uh, the conversation of expertise that you had earlier. Hyperloop yep. was a largely mechanical engineering project. Yep. And I'm here yep. as a civil engineer. Um, but I really wanted to be a part of it. And I felt like it was exciting and it was innovative and it could really impact our industry and our society. And that's what kind of drove me in that direction. And from there, that eventually, of course, led me to the Boring Company, which led me to you know, seeing the world of SpaceX, seeing the different innovations that are possible in the field that I believe I'm skilled at. And that yep. eventually led to rockets here at Relativity Space. So it was a much different path than, than Adrian. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting when we think from a, for both of you. Thank you for that very, very much, Arva. But thanks to both of you, because when you think of your paths, you know, both of you had you did both did this, and say, Arva, you kind of made a little bit bigger mm -hmm. uh, German Schwankungen than uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and Adrian did. But you both have landed at a spot where I think is extremely personally satisfying for both of you. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that, and both of you have, are, are, have this purpose of trying to be part of something bigger right now. When we think about the culture of innovation, coming back to the title, we mo you mentioned at the very beginning, but how, to what degree, like on a scale of zero to 100, does this purpose, this higher purpose, is it required for a culture of innovation? Is it a must have, nice to have, doesn't really matter? What do you think? Uh, I think it's, it's more of a, let's say a nice to have. I don't think you need this specific purpose. Like I don't think my purpose has to be 3D printing a rocket, but my mm -hmm. purpose can be finding a way to make an interplanetary future, for example. So yeah. I have some sort of ultimate purpose, but it doesn't have to be so specific in order to encourage innovation. It can just be a general inspiration, a general goal rather than a specific one. Mm -hmm. How about you, Adrian? Yeah, I think I think this is obviously quite quite personal and um, and different for everyone. But um, I also would say that um, the higher purpose it doesn't has to be the the holy goal of uh, you know something 
like the biggest um, the biggest whatever it is uh, it can be it can be smaller scale and it can be replaced as well i mean um that i'm here now uh, as you said before yeah that that was a result from many circumstances including luck and it could have been very different and i still think i could be highly motivated to work in a different field um still i think for me personally what's what drives me is is some purpose that is beyond in my very opinion uh, uh commercial commercial aspects i think that never triggered um inspiration uh, in my case and uh, i think in some cases this might be that if if you have if you have a commercial purpose maybe that's sufficient to be innovative um uh, truly sure. yeah okay. i think so, that's a really interesting point adrian that you you bring up motivation because I think a large amount of people are driven financially, right? They have a financial goal. Some people are driven by, let's say, recognition, right? They just want to be recognized for something. A few people are driven by a larger purpose that involves them having an impact in a field that they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, motivation. Go ahead, Adrian. I just think I never met someone that was truly happy with the job if it was a purely commercial purpose behind it. Um, but maybe I, I simply haven't met enough people, um, and I'm sure there are. You know that I, I see also the the problems you could solve um, in stock markets uh, and whatever. And I think. He, it doesn't really matter whether you want to build a complicated engineering device or engineer some routines that really exploits the stock market. I think you know as soon as you are thrilled by the challenge, I think you can you can get engaged. But if it's for the sake of a good salary and uh, that's the reason you do the job and not because of the innovation, you can be involved. I think then those people I know they are not truly happy in the in the job they do. But yeah, there might be others. I think it's always a balance, right? Sure. I think I think the motivation is a wonderful word to put on the table, like as, to understand within a team, as you said before earlier, without saying that word specifically, trying to understand the team and to what motivates them, how to engage with them, how to bring out the best in the team. This is understanding their motives, motivation. I think that's a really, really important important thing so and you, you get to know that at, at the end oh. i have to say this is also in the daily daily life um yeah. much more rewarding aspect of work uh, it's not that uh, sure. you know, working for a big project or uh, something that everyone reads in the news um, is important but having having to engage with the team and do this daily interaction for me this is the much more rewarding uh, aspect of, of the line of work i'm doing yeah mm -hmm. So someone's put a question in that I think is really fantastic. And as it's when <clears throat> I'm interpreting, when when you're in the brainstorming process and the storming process, and you've got all these ideas that's your team, how do you begin to effectively and efficiently sift through them to determine which ones you want to try to follow up on? Right. It's a great question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Either of you uh, have a, a tool and a trick? <laughs> I don't think there's a there's a trick necessarily. I think number one, I think it's a great problem to have as long as everyone who's giving the ideas is, you know, obviously having um, you know, adding value, right? Um, for that amount, it's really about first of all, you need to have some sort of management in the team, right? There has to be a known leader. I think that teams that don't have a known leader that have multiple leaders have a lot more problems with this um, from personal experience. Mm -hmm. But when you are able to have that, you have to, in my opinion, put the onus back on them to look at the pros and cons of their ideas. What is the value of your idea, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, hey, let's, make a car fly. Now on the surface, that seems like such a great idea. Why do you want the car to fly? Well, we want to, you know, make an innovation within the vehicle industry. We want to relieve traffic, blah, blah, blah. What are the pros and cons? Number one, 
you have a car flying over yeah. someone's head, they're not exactly going to be excited to see it, right? Number two, you know, the cost, the time, blah, blah, blah. I think you should have them evaluate the pros and cons, especially when you're working with a large group. Um, they should be able to evaluate the exact um, value of, the, of their own idea. Uh, and that certainly helps a lot. On the other hand, you are able to do that yourself, um, you know, as a managing team member, as a leader, blah, blah, blah. But then it's a little bit harder to understand their perspective because, you know, maybe you might say, hey, let's build a flying car. And the other person's like, mm, I don't like heights. I don't want to build a flying car. So it's important, I think, to also gain their perspective. That's how mm -hmm. you start seeing the difference between the pros and the cons of every single idea. And then you can kind of filter, reduce. And then once you come to maybe just two or three ideas, you can bring that to the team and say, these are the implications of every single one. Let's see which one will actually work out the best. Mm -hmm. And you follow that one, which you've collectively agreed upon. What about you, Adrian? You've got... You're you're on the James Webb Telescope. You've got your you've got an instrumentation problem. You can't get the gizmo and the gadget. Um, yeah, no, I think Arvo made now a, a clear example, but I, I think it's very along the line. I would have described it as well with a different example. Um, I, I think yeah, one of the important things at the beginning is that you you tried and that's very difficult to to get these ideas unbiased. Um, and then at some point you have to stop this and then try to find a figure of merit uh, in order to assess you know, a trade between the different IDs, uh, which one you can remove immediately, which one might be worth discussing, which one actually are really worth uh, pursuing. Sometimes this process is not uh, easy. Sometimes it's not uh, in one go. Sometimes you need actually time to process and then natural selection by forgetting one or the other IDs also helps. And very often it's also a democratic process that if, if you have different opinions, um, no real strong arguments in one or the other direction, but at the end, yeah, you judge on based on a majority of opinions. And yeah. this is where Arvo is saying you need to have a good leader because at the end of the day, he or she or they have to make the decision to be a leader. But what about, so you said so unbiased opinions mm -hmm. or unbiased. So how important is an unbiased idea versus a biased? Well, no, I would say if you're in a in a declared phase of a brainstorming exercise where you try to collect ideas, where you try to actually also get ideas from those who might might be more shy or are acquired, it doesn't help if you immediately give a response to ideas and say, well, you know, there might be this and this disadvantage. Um, because right. that discourages people to speak up because they might that, that's that's different than to the an unbiased idea versus a critical response. You know, this right. is, I, I agree with what you just said. I yeah. was going to say, I didn't entirely agree with the unbiased ideas. I want yes. people's biases to come That's out. Because yeah. so. especially I want to know them. I want to know your bias. And if I know your bias and I have your idea, then go, okay, that's interesting. No, I, 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 I meant to listen to it unbiased. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah, okay, that's cool. That's good. I, I there I totally, totally agree with. I think that's really interesting. So what about like, I know sometimes in the engineering world, which both of us, all of us are in, there are very specific tools you use to assess the validity of, of ideas. Uh, do, do, do you guys use you know, any very specific tools like performers and say, okay, we've got all these ideas now. Here are these six criteria. You're going to rate them, mm -hmm. you know, viability, our, our personal capability, the timeline, you say, you know, one to five, bum, bum, bum. Or do you just kind of go, okay, leader comes in, he, she, they, to make a decision? Well, in, in, in our case, uh, it is a part of the process to define this, what I called before, figure of merit, um, the trade table okay. or whatever. And usually that is a hard exercise to come up with. And again, this is nothing that can be done um, unilaterally by imposing it from top to down. This is something that has to be evaluated. Which criteria are important, which are less? How do we wait? Um, do we consider timeline at all? Is it relevant? You know, um, and that, that is a process that usually requires a back and forth. And yeah. Okay. So I, I didn't hear I didn't hear that. Arvi, you agree with that? Yeah, and I think it varies from project to project and from team to team. And um, that I would absolutely agree with some of those categories, you know, viability. I would also, and costs, 
schedule, et cetera, the general ones. I would also say simplicity. A big one at relativity where I'm currently at is nodes of simplicity. How to make sure that you're not creating this complex idea to solve a problem just for the sake of complexity. How do you simplify it? Because at the end of the day, you need to be able to replicate it, right? Um, most problems that we're solving in the engineering world are not problems that we're solving one time. They're problems that we intend to solve over and over and over again. And when they're overly complex, it's really hard to replicate them. Not only do they take a lot of time and effort, but you have more room for error. And in what we're in here in our field, we want to reduce that room for error as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So where are we with launching up into space? And how close are we to 3D printing a rocket and to you uh, realizing the dream? Yeah, I think you can see the smile on my face. I'm very, very <laughs> excited. We're going to be launching our first test mission this year uh, which is just an incredible cool. thing to, to come out of my mouth. Um, we're doing very well. We've, we've built our first 3D printed rocket, which is a crazy thing to say. Ooh. And we're testing it, you know, and we're, we're finishing it. We're essentially tying it up, putting on uh, the, the final details. And we're now in the, in the testing phase, essentially, of the rocket. Looking forward to launching the first test mission this year. So this is just a... Okay, this is my personal curiosity here. So have you actually 3D printed like the whole, the nozzles, just pretty like everything? Almost everything, yeah. The, I mean, a rocket is essentially a giant fuel tank, right? If you think yeah. about it. Uh, that fuel tank is 3D printed. The engine itself is 3D printed. The components within the engine are mostly 3D printed. Um, granted, they're 3D printed using different methods, uh, sure. And that's what, you know, allows us to build things simpler, better, mm -hmm. less parts, faster. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's crazy to think about. It's crazy to see in person. Uh, it's even crazier to see the design that goes behind it, right? Because designing something for 3D printing, those of you that in the audience that have an experience yeah. with that, you know that you have to design it differently. You can't just yeah. get a normal rocket and put it through and say, okay, go ahead, print it you have to define oh. it very differently to account for the things that happen during 3D printing, the different shapes, how it, how yeah. it actually, you know, it comes up after it's done. So very, very interesting process. And just to That's add, really it also provides you with many more capabilities. I mean, you can design things in, in a very different way than standard. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, I think that's the freedom that, most of the people at my company enjoy too, because you're able to propose different iterations at a much higher rate. Mm. And uh, of mm. course, three of us being engineers, we enjoy that, right? We want to provide different ideas. We wanna change something last minute. We wanna say, hey, wait a minute, this is good, but I think I can make it great. Can we change this? And you're able <laughs> to change it in a much faster way, which is uh, really valuable. I guess for both of you, when it comes to your work, Good enough is not good enough. It has to be great. <laughs> well, um, I would agree. Uh, the, the sentence that was written on my PhD thesis when I started, or my, my, my plan for the PhD thesis by my doctor father was, failure is no option. Yeah. So um, I take it from that side. Um, and indeed, if you launch something into space that has high value, uh, failure is not an option. And um, this drives quite a lot of um, design decisions. It drives quite a lot of decisions along the way in order to you know, stay as conservative as possible. It sounds very boring. It's not, mm -hmm. but um, indeed, this is a very different way of um, thinking about this problem and thinking about this high-tech stuff we do, that actually it's low-tech. It's uh, the lowest tech that you can, and yet there is a lot of invention uh, and innovation going into that, but with, yeah, mm -hmm. that are as low as possible. So in that sense, um, good enough is, is not sufficient. Yeah, indeed. Um, and, and yet it has a, a slightly twist that you also have to think about um, robustness and um, yeah, this kind of aspects. Um, in addition, at some points you cannot continue optimizing. Um, we also see this again and again because we are you know, still science driven. And uh, as a scientist, we, we tend to, to maximize endlessly um, 
uh, performance, uh, mm -hmm. quality, etc. But if you want to do a project, if you want to build something that um, functions at some given time, you have to come to that point that you accept. Okay, you say, it's, boom. it's not. It's not going to be superb. It might be having a slight compromise built in, and yet it's still good enough. So, and this is difficult sometimes to make these yeah. judgments. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? For you, are was this? Uh perfection and does perfection get in the way of innovation it absolutely does get in the way um but i will disagree with one thing i think for for my field personally i wouldn't say that failure is not an option only because in order to say that then everything must be perfect um or near perfect right especially when you're dealing with the tolerances and space which you know well it's it's a little bit harder um, it also means that in order to reach that level of perfection and to almost say with 100% certainty that the mission will succeed, you will spend a lot more time and a lot more money perfecting that thing, right? So you have to have multiple iterations. You have to have multiple tests. You have to have, you know, so many analyses to ensure that things will work and money and time can be very prohibitive of that. But at some point you have to say, we believe with X percent certainty that this will work. And the only way yep. to know with 100% certainty is to test it. And yep. you have to accept the fact that if you test it, you may not have 100% success, but the yep. only way you can reach it is to accept a little bit of failure in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this is that we're coming, a personal question. When you're looking at your life, when we think of the culture of innovation, where could you say that you found, because here's a point in my life where someone influenced me to innovate. And innovate is this, to, to have this sort of inflection point or a moment where like, oh man, okay. What was that? Arva, you're shaking your head and Adrian's looking, he's, he's, he's thinking. So you're gonna go first and, Give Adrian a moment. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I had several moments of this and in different points in my life. Um, the first time I had that was, I think, um, when Elon Musk released his white paper on the Hyperloop. Um, when I read it, when I saw it, I thought, this is a pretty crazy idea. But if someone with this much success is putting out this idea that he hasn't done himself, then I must be able to at least try. I must be able mm. to think of how we can possibly do this. How can we achieve this? How can we make this a reality? And that's when I kind of was, you know, racking my brain trying to think of something which, frankly, I didn't have many, many skills in. I didn't have much expertise in. I was a civil engineer and this doesn't have much to do with that at, at the time, at least. This is before tunneling. But um, yeah, that, that was the first time when I was like, okay, wait a minute, I can really apply myself to, to innovate, to think outside the box. And that's when I was kind of pushed to have that mindset for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because my son went to Cal Poly in mechanical engineering, was part of the Hyperloop team working on it down there. And, and it was very interesting to feel the challenge because yeah. it was an inflection point for him. Yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely but i think projects like that can really change you like yeah. my team within hyperloop even the teams when i was the director they became almost like my family you know we were driving towards the school together and i have to say a special hello to everyone at eth who is an alumni of swiss loop and swiss loop tunneling because we became a family you know you spend so much time with these people um, and you're pushed to innovate so much together that your mindset and your life really does change. Well, thank you for the shout out. We appreciate that very much. Adrian, what about you? I have to admit that I cannot distinct, uh, find a distinct moment where it started because it was somehow always there. But maybe I, I want to answer differently by saying that right now we have such a moment um, because we are thinking about the next step or maybe it's the uh, over next step about the... Yeah. Uh, a very ambitious space mission that I see now inspiring um, students to, you know, they want to do a PhD with us or work with us on 
on this very, very challenging problems ahead. And um, we are right now starting in the lab, uh, getting in this direction, and we're just, yeah, are trying to uh, invent every day new, new methods to achieve yeah. very high accuracy optical uh, performing measurements. And at the end, yeah, it might be the next big thing coming up. And um, we, we, we hope very much about this vision. So yeah. Maybe not a straight answer to your question, but uh, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, it's good. So you're thinking about the next and how that how that impacts. It's in, it's as as the web unfolded, and now is starting to view and to see things we've never been able to see before mm -hmm. at the same detail. You know, it's going to create a whole new inflection point in the entire domain of astrophysics probably and what i what i like most about this is because now i have the privilege to talk uh, sometimes in front of a public audience about james webb seeing seeing the sparks in the in the young eyes you know and uh, yeah. realizing that this creates an impact on on the next generation or maybe even the generation afterwards um to be inspired about this kind of things and maybe even go into the, this direction later um this is really what i find most rewarding at this stage to realize that it's now up to the next generation to get inspired and um have this inflection point of innovation that's really cool i like that very very much i have a, one question came in i'm not sure if you'll be able to answer that is that sometimes innovation processes are seen as battlefields for competing ideas and how do you do you have any ideas on how you avoid them becoming a battlefield versus which is a negative implication versus a positive implication of unfolding of opportunity rather than an, an internal destruction any ideas on that great question yeah 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 definitely um this is this is an interesting topic because i think competition can both be encouraging and poisonous to that kind of team environment that creates innovation. Um, I myself am a very competitive person. So I know, I know when it gets, you know, a little bit more heated sometimes when you have conflicting ideas, conflicting paths that you want to take, I don't think you can avoid it. I think the fact that you have it is actually a very positive thing because it means you have people who are passionate about what you're creating and you have to recognize that. But this also goes back to you need to have, nonetheless, a leader that is able to distinguish and to perhaps disperse the responsibility. So if multiple people have ideas, like I said, put the onus on them as much as you can to provide the pros and cons of the different ideas that come through, but also perhaps to disperse the, um, let's say, the departments that they're going towards, right? Maybe one person can um, lead one part of the project, the other person can lead a different part. Uh, maybe one person can apply research and develop that idea while you work on the other idea if it's feasible. So I don't think you can avoid that, but you can try to deal with it by number one, having, having a known leader. If you have two leaders who are very competitive, you're not gonna go anywhere. But also <laughs> to give them different responsibilities within the team and to empower them to say why their idea is better and not with an opinionated manner, but rather with a very logical manner that you're able to measure. I, I like to add here that usually um, one tries to solve a problem and uh, everyone tries to solve the problem, comes up maybe with a different flavor of a solution, maybe a complete different solution, but at the end, there is again a common goal which is solving this problem and then yeah. if, if there are competing ideas around and there is then a discussion a evaluation and one might win and the other not it's it's the ego that at the end um counts whether you know you you can accept yeah. this or whether you you would be stubborn on on your idea and i think that is at the, at the end i think if, if you really think in this team matter uh you want to solve the problem together I think usually shouldn't happen. I mean, uh, people should take back their ego yeah. to some extent. Yeah, I think it's in my experience, I'll just add that into this Grant's response that sometimes it is a battlefield. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But it's, I think we come back to what both of you said right at the very beginning is what's the big goal? And if, and if the big goal doesn't coincide with your big goal, then it's time to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> or if, if the or if the big goal is just there and maybe this this loss in that moment moves you here but the goal is still the same you just have to kind of go with it you know and this is my 
my experience on that is sometimes you, and it's true. Sometimes goals change. Indeed, yeah. Right, and that's it. Could be you know, Adrian, with you, with next telescope might be something which you don't really want to be a part of because you kind of go, hey, that's not the kind of mission I want to be a part of. Absolutely. Or, <laughs> right, and this is, but this is also part of being a, a professional, deciding where we want to go. You know, yeah. so in our very last few moments, um, I want to ask you two things, or I'm trying to ask one and a half things. So, <laughs> um, what is the biggest surprise you expect to see with with both of your work? What's the surprise? I mean, you can't predict a surprise, but what do you what do you imagine is going to be like a surprise? Like, oh my God, I I think. I can't. I can't believe we might do this, like with James Webb. What's a, what, what's your big hope, your big surprise you're hoping to find? Well, with James Webb, um, there will be many surprises that uh, that will come that no one is expecting. I mean, we built this this great facility for dedicated science questions, and yet everyone is hoping, and I think that's not a hope that will be just reality. That the things will blow our minds that we didn't expect, and I'm. I think we have to wait one or two more months and then we, we're there. Uh, we will get surprises <laughs> in our minds. And um, I'm well, looking forward to that very much. Yeah. I actually, I can't wait because I remember when the Hubble images came out. Okay, there were surprises like, as well at the beginning. We don't want to go there. <laughs> no, no, no. But no, but, but truly, yeah, yeah. we, get, we began to be able to see things we could never see before. I, I don't, I'm not worried about all that. We'll figure that out. But it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it truly was amazing. You know? Yeah. So, what about you, for Arvind? What about you? That's a tough question. I think my entire project is kind of a surprise to people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think whenever you say I'm 3D printing something, people are like, "Oh, cool!" You know, like you're, you know, you're going with like technology. Say, that's great. Hey, yeah. 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 You're yeah. you're printing a little car or something. That's cool. And then when I say that we're trying to 3D print one of the most difficult, complex things that you can possibly work on in the world, people are more like, mm, no, you're not. You know, that, there's no way you can do that. Um, so I think the surprise is going to be for people to kind of see our hard work come to life in the coming months and seeing not only a 3D, pre 3D printed uh, rocket attempt to launch to space, but also how much of it is actually 3D printed and see how it's coming to life and the possibilities yeah. that come with this technology. Because we're not only um, impacting you know, our company, but this would be a huge win for, I think, the entire aerospace industry and, and much larger when you're able to see that you're 3D printing objects of this complexity and this size. Well, looking forward to launch our next satellite with 3D printed rockets from you. Yes. <laughs> there we go. The collaboration started right here. That would here. be great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, listen, both of you, Adrian and Arva, I want to thank both of you. Our hour has literally flown by, mm -hmm. not as fast as you probably will get up to space, <laughs> but it has truly flown by. And it has been a real pleasure for me personally and for our audience to um, have this chat with you today about culture of innovation. Thank you. And, it, was, um, it was great indeed yeah. uh, talking to both of you. Yes. Thank you, Adrian. Really? Thanks, Thank Arvin. There's one, there's, there's one thing I neglected to say at the very beginning was to say happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate is, it. I'm glad I got uh, to spend it with all of you. Well, thank you on your birthday to delightful both of you are amazing humans and i wish you well with your missions thank you very well. much and for all of our audience i'd like to thank you very much for joining us today our next global lecture will be on the 30th of june with akansha akansha katri from the world economic forum and peter edwards emeritus professor in plant ecology from the th in zurich so it's the 30th of june be looking for it's going to be another great conversation so with that i wish all of you stay healthy drink lots of water eat an apple and we'll see you soon take care bye, -bye.